So welcome everybody. I will go ahead and call the meeting to order for the City of Essex Junction Liquor Board meeting for Wednesday, November 9th, 2022 to order. Do we have any agenda additions or changes for tonight? Hearing none, no need to approve the agenda. We'll go right into business item 4A, a discussion and consideration of a first class restaurant bar license for Namaste Garden. So uh, we received this application. The voters voted that we can do this. So it's exciting. Um, it's a new um, restaurant, Namaste Garden. Um, these applications come through the clerk's office. We get the payment, half goes to the state, half comes to us. Um, and we haven't thought through a process of doing this on our own. We certainly can, but we followed the town policy, which is to get a criminal background check through the police department. So as far as I know, we don't have that yet. So if um, but I didn't want to hold this up and wait since it's a new restaurant. So if it's the recommendation, if you're open to it, is to um, approve it with those uh, pending yeah. items. Appreciate that, Regina. I think just especially given the fact that we're at a point in time in the year where we might not be meeting as often as we normally do, we don't want to delay them and their capability. So I would certainly entertain the motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we approve the first class uh, restaurant bar uh, license from a Namaste Garden pending um, the outcome of the uh, the police for the, the criminal and background check. check. Yeah. And the receipt of the application fee. Yes. There. Great. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Raj. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great, so that passed unanimously. Thank you all. That would conclude the business of the uh, liquor board meeting. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn the liquor board meeting. So moved. Thank you, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great, liquor control board is done. We're gonna do this one more time for a different board before we get into the full city council meeting. So bear with us, everybody. The uh, next item, uh, welcome everybody, call the meeting to order for the City of Essex Junction Local Cannabis Control Commission. Call that meeting to order for Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. Any agenda additions or changes? None for me. Great, counselors, anything? No, no. Great, forgot to ask that earlier, sorry. Let's jump into business item 4A and discussion and consideration of the tier one indoor cultivation license. So, uh, you've got an application in front of you, and these folks are here. Um, and so uh, essentially, uh, they've got a tier one cannabis uh, cultivation license from the state pending local approval. Um, the LDC changes that the city council put in adopted on October 14th come into effect October 5th, um, only allow cultivation in one zoning district, the planned agricultural zoning district. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and these folks are in a residential zoning district. Um, so uh, they've applied for their <clears throat> home occupation and as acting zoning administrator, I've denied that. Um, they've got an appeal for that that will move forward through the development review board. Um, but also as a part of this uh, local cannabis control commission uh, would issue a license uh, for this operation. But again, staff's perspective is based on the LDCs that were amended. Um, I, my position is that I don't think you have authority to approve the license, mm -hmm. um, but that's what we've got in front of you. Thank you, Regina. And uh, we can't change the land development code as it stands. So really the only thing we can do tonight is either to approve or deny given the facts that we have in front of us. Yeah. Absolutely. I just wanted to help to make sure to, to frame it. Um, but please feel free to come on up. I'd sit at the, the uh, table here with the microphone so that way everybody can hear you if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so my name here. is Elise Martin, and I'm speaking as an agent on behalf of Adria Lanza, who is really kind of the, the proprietor of Passion Fruit Farms. And we understand the land development change codes. However, um, 
we did our own research and stuff. I actually, mm-hmm. we, we did a real job, you know, just stay at home and grow weed. He worked for the hospital. I actually worked for a law firm. So we're, mm-hmm. you know, trying to end this stigma around marijuana cultivation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just like to say that first. It seems that the land development code, however, isn't in compliance with state statute, which says that you must treat cannabis related businesses as any other business, meaning if we do meet the requirements for a home occupancy permit, that you must give it to us and you cannot deny it on the sole reasoning that Mm -hmm. it's cannabis related, which is what several of your emails and correspondences with Regina, no fault of her own, Mm -hmm. has made clear. So I'm just wondering, does that stand hold if your land development code is not in compliance with state statute? As this was being developed, it was being developed with consultation of our attorney as well, who's told us all along the way that we've been doing things legally uh, in in the right legal way uh, and had had abs- especially with this one component that we were legally authorized to do this. Okay. So we, we have that of our of our attorney who tells us we can. So that's- We also, so maybe yeah. that is something, you know, yep. obviously it's an interpretation of the law. So our attorney said, you know, we're, they were happy to come with us tonight, but they were like, you, you understand the argument and you can articulate mm-hmm. it very clearly. And if, if yep. needs so, then we're happy to act on your behalf. So obviously we don't want it to get litigious. It seems very, simple and, and mm-hmm. like easy that you would make that decision in our favor considering Essex Village is technically the one at fault. So given that we do have an opinion from our attorney that tells us how we should do this for us to then go against our own attorney's opinion personally is not something that I really want to do. Is it possible to get that written up from your attorney? Could we get a write up of his reasoning <coughs> and his answer to our um, basically our statement that Essex Village is in violation of state statute 24 and 27 and subsections of those. As those who were more involved. Yeah, I mean, we also have this from the um, attorney for the Cannabis Control Board. Yes. Um, that what we're doing is in compliance. Okay. Um, but do you have that in a written statement from them that we could actually refer I'm sure back we do to our somewhere. attorney? I'm not sure if that's appropriate in this case, though. It, we are, I'm sure it exists somewhere, there. and we can get back with our with our attorney about whether that's client attorney privilege, whether that's something that's I mean, open record. But law and that's what your attorney yeah. is filing, then they should have no problem giving that over. Do, is that something that we would have to have our attorney request from your attorney? I would likely suggest that, just given that, frankly, with attorney to attorney, can make things a little bit quicker and easier in some ways. Right. So yep. just none of us are attorneys. So village, you guys aren't able to be helpful toward that. I wouldn't say it's not able to be helpful. It's following the guidance from our attorney, and for us to then not follow the guidance from our attorney would open us up to other potential issues down the road. You don't think that following the state statute would be more beneficial to your position? I'm not going to change my response. Okay. Thank That's you. Fine. Well, we appreciate. It. Can I, can I just Please, make one free. comment? I, I don't, and I don't want to get involved in the discussion of the attorneys, and I think it would be great if the two, two attorneys mm-hmm. can communicate and clear it up for you. Um, the only thing I would say is that the, the reason for our zoning, to understand it, if someone wants to have a, a dairy farm or an apple orchard or, you know, grow for, for any kind of commercial use of agriculture, and I think this was one of the things that I, I was confused about that came down the road with all this, it's that we, we obviously, as a city where we have really confined quarters for most of it, we have, a long time ago, they, they started regulating agricultural production and okay. said it can only happen in one part of the city and it can't happen anywhere you want. And I think there's, there, it seemed to me that there was obviously going to be, and I understand exactly what you're saying, a conflict between what the state was saying that this should be, there shouldn't be anything that inhibits the, um, the cannabis. And so, it does, I did see this conflict coming and so I'm not surprised, but I wanted to just give you the background of why we have these these zoning regulations. So I just wanna put this before you, right? because we've asked this and we've received the same answer as well. Mm-hmm. So if somebody was growing tomatoes on a tier one cultivation level, met all of the requirements for a home occupancy permit, we've heard from your office that you guys would grant that, but not because it's cannabis related. So that was the reason that was given back to us. If we were growing tomatoes, you guys would allow it, home occupancy permit. But if because it's cannabis related, that that's the reason for the denial. 
So that's what we have in an email. That's what's in violation. So, and if we meet all of the requirements for a home occupancy permit, then we should be a, approved for that because so, you can't discriminate just because we're cannabis related. So in our conversations with the CCB and our attorney, this um, we're not doing this as discriminating against cannabis. Okay. The highlighted sections of the code that you are the uh, statutes, excuse me, that you <clears throat> that you brought with you in your in the uh, appeal, um, the determination from the CCB and from our attorney is that we are treating this as we would any other business. There are several business types in the chart that we don't allow in other places as per the LDC, and this is one of them. And so it it's you know. I hear what you're saying, but we How are the it, opinion of the of the. Um, but we meet all of the requirements for a mm -hmm. home occupancy permit, so that's what I'm not understanding. We're not mm -hmm. changing anything. There's no signs. There's not nobody's coming. Anything. We have secure cameras. We don't want people coming to our property. Mm -hmm. We're distributing off the property to other licensed state like state licensed individuals that we have contracts with that are followed and recorded by the state down to the gram. We're not doing any sort of sales. We're not in a restricted air retail area, which we have no interest in doing. We don't want to open a shop. We don't want to sell. We just want to grow and get it off of our property, the same that tom tomato growers would do for a farmer's market. We're not doing anything that is considered illegal by the state of Vermont. And we're not, our license isn't pending. We have it, it is active. Our person came they said your license is active it's not pending anything so you certainly could go, go back and and say no we're not going to do that but i think that that would just be perpetuating the stigma against marijuana and if you really want to help people be innovative and have biz businesses in essex and in shitna county and in vermont in general you should really be more supportive of that thank you okay thank you if Anything else, counselors? No. If not, I would entertain the motion as we have in front of us. Um, I move that the Essex Junction Local Cannabis Control Commission deny the tier one indoor cultivation license for Adrian Lanza, Passion Fruit Farms, LLC. Second. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dan. Any further discussion? I, I, I would like to see uh, some written resolution of this fairly soon. It, that's the week that's the, it's, uh, for all parties concerned. Yeah, because uh, it it is confusing. I, I do. It, I think we agree that there's a, a a nucleus of confusion at the center of this. I, in my right. opinion, that has been Thanks. part of the conversation with yeah. the state and our lawmakers for some time. And I, I think we we go <clears throat> to to the applicants as well to give them some clear kind of guidance here. And you know, yeah. All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. All right. Aye. Those opposed, please say nay. Great, so that passed unanimously. Thank you all. And at that <clears throat> moment, I would entertain the motion to adjourn the uh, Local Cannabis Control Commission. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great, thank you, everybody. And now welcome everybody to the City of Essex Junction City Council meeting for Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, third time's the charm. <laughs> Call the meeting to order and do we have any agenda additions or changes? Uh, sorry, I do not though. I do just suggest if CCRPC Charlie Baker mm -hmm. is able to come earlier, if we are at a place where we could move him up earlier, that'd be great. He's just at another meeting yeah. and so. Yeah, we were expecting him at about 7.30, uh, but given how that may change, if we don't mind having some flexibility, that'd be great. All right, so no changes, no need to approve the agenda. So now we can go into the public to be heard. So now is a portion of tonight's meeting where if there are members of the public who wish to bring something to the board's attention that is not on the agenda, now is the time to do so. For those of you who are using uh, Zoom, please go ahead, raise your hand so that that way I can uh, make sure to call on you as well. For those in the room, if you could just raise your hand so I can see how many people would be interested at speaking in public to be heard for those items not on the agenda. If it is on the agenda, we will make time for that. Okay, so one in the room, I see one on Zoom. So we'll go ahead and start with those in the room. Annie, if you'd like to go ahead, please come on up. Hi. 
It's a crap shoot if my voice is gonna come out in the first go. I'm a little nervous. I'm not normally nervous when I'm in a room with you guys, but um, I wanna make sure that what I'm saying is effectively communicated by me and heard by you. Um, as some of you know, I had made a post to Facebook and there was some intense discussion about whether or not I should have posted that to Facebook and so forth. Um, some community residents, not on boards, not staff, were saying I should have done so in an email, but I was ruminating out loud. And I want to do that now. I, I want to ruminate. And I, I guess I'm, the questions I'm going to ask are more, well, they're a little bit rhetorical. And mostly I want to kind of know, like, I stood in the street with signs for you guys. I'm here for you. You know, I'm, I, I trust you. I'm happy that you're here, Amber, Amber also. Um, and my questions and ruminations, and I'll get to my point soon, I'm sorry, are more like, I guess I want to make sure you're thinking them too. Because if you are, then, then, sorry, 57 hot flash. If you are, then I feel good. And so some of what I'm going to say, I know you're already thinking of, but I want to just lay it all out there so that my community knows that I'm thinking about it and that we can travel forward together well. Okay. I not really say anything yet. Um, so the other day on Facebook, uh, in our city group slash village group, a community resident put forth the idea that they, they were concerned that there had been a fee collected um, for an event. And the manner in which it was put forth understandably created some friction in the discussion. For me, it made me consider thoughts I was already having, and it made me look at the bigger picture. So for example, four weeks previous to this event, we had been giving out money in vouchers to our residents. So out and about slash Junction Gym, we gave freely and happily and joyously, right? Well-spent idea that the tax dollars that we have can be utilized to do two things. One, put money into our, actually three things, right? Four, put money into our residents' hands, have that money because it's a voucher. And that voucher can, for those who don't know, out and about in Essex and Junction Jam is, a, 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 it was the third event for, if we count the original uh, outside one, open and outside, that the vouchers are tax dollars that we, that the council and then trustees at the time decided would go into participating businesses to kind of make sure people are shopping locally and inject money where the pandemic has caused a problem. It went so well, we kept doing it. Great, huge fan, as you know. But when this resident was concerned about the fee that got charged, and I, I don't want to be offensive to staff that's here, but I'm going to say what it is so that we all know. It was a Halloween event at EGRP, and it was a $5 you could, if, if I get it wrong, please someone correct me, $5 you could pay ahead of time, um, $10 day of for I think a group of five or seven, I don't know. Um, and so the query by the resident was, why am I paying for this? And some responses were, you know, it costs a lot to put together such an event. The event is amazing. The event is incredible. It's getting bigger every year. People are leaving the Silly Hill event, which I guess doesn't happen anymore, to come see this. It's great. The event is amazing. The community loves it. That's great. Um, and so when the query about the charge was put forth, the city resident was unaware, through nobody's fault, that there would be a fee. And when the city resident arrived there with their child, they could view the, the preliminary component, but not do the trick-or-treat piece. Fine, that's the rules, whatever. Um, she, was she was surprised and then left because at that moment did not have the ability to do so. For me, watching our community shut that down was shocking because we're here for equity, right? We're constantly talking about equity, that's our work. That's what we're doing. And to me, in this situation, 
That's not equitable. It doesn't live in the space of equity that we discuss. Now, how do we resolve such a thing, right? It's not easy to put forth the activities. It's expensive to put forth. What do we do? Are we looking at the bigger picture? Four weeks previously, we gave residents $15 a piece to put into businesses. It's, it's baffling, not baffling like, but wait a minute, we have to look at this. That's what I'm trying to say. The, my, my questions are, why aren't we looking at the bigger picture of events and how the year is going? Why aren't we determining how to more equitably distribute funds and create space? Because for me, I'd rather I'll climb back into it again and start helping sponsorships to run the Junction Jam. And let's make sure that the Halloween event is free. Well, what do we need to do to make it free? How do we live in equity? Because Halloween and trick-or-treating should not cost money. But this event needs money. It's a great event, right? And how do we do that? So I'm, I, 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 right? And then, again, no offense to staff that happens to be in the room. And I probably should have been saying it anyway because they're watching for other staff. The... The cost, I'm not sure how it gets determined and I don't personally wanna know. I just wanna know that you know. And I wanna know that you're wanting to find out. I don't need to know why or how, but those were my questions and I blurted them out on Facebook because the level of aggression towards the original question was really frustrating me. The, the original post on Facebook about, um, about why, the, why the event costs money. There were a lot of people really kind of arguing that this is a great event. Why would you? It's only if you bring if you bring your neighbor's kids. It's only uh, such and such a dollars per person. But when we look at equity, we don't look at it like that. And then I want to know: Are you asking the right questions? Are you thinking to yourself, why does it cost this much? How did we get to this fee? Um, are you asking yourself why it was cash preferred? Can we not do something less messy than this? It's dark out, cash is changing hands, it's just messy. It just doesn't have to happen that way, in my opinion. It doesn't have to be your opinion too. But when I go in and pay my $7 fee for my dog license, if it's still $7, I don't remember, I get a handwritten receipt, right? That's how a cash transaction should occur. There's, I mean, maybe, maybe it did happen like that, but I can't imagine it. What, what are our transactions? How do we ingest money? And is it clean and appropriate to 2022? And do you know how the decisions get made about the pricing? I'm not asking you to tell me. I'm over it. I mean, sorry, I don't mean I'm over it. I mean, I, I just want to know that you're thinking about this. And then, sorry, I've been talking so long. Are we only serving? Like, I want to make sure that we're, that we're serving equity for real and not just talking about it and creating committees for it. I want to make sure we're actually doing it. Um, and then, this is a, an actual question that I hope we can get. And I'm sorry, I'll be, I'm almost done. I'm sorry, I really did talk too much. Um, like, is it possible to have a kind of flow chart for those of us who are residents to understand how our government works? I remember when I was in elementary school, which was a very long time ago, like in the 70s, early 70s, that there was like some kind of flow chart for how government worked, right? So our schools could use it. Like if we put together a good one, it's great. Because it really is, to me, it should be in the history books that we became a separate city. It's amazing what y'all did. It's amazing. Can we create a, a, a flow chart or something that explains what each department is, what the titles and roles are? It doesn't matter who's in them. That's, that doesn't matter. But how it functions. How does our government function down to everything? For example, which departments ingest money? You know, and why? Not not why, like why, but like why? And and how does it work? And who's in charge of that? Does the, you know, does the, I don't know, Jess's full title, the, the finance office? Finance director. Hi, Regina, I'm Annie. Thank you. Nice to meet you, finance director. Like, how does that work? So my curiosity, and I hope it's yours, and I hope other people wonder this too, is how does it work from city council through our new manager, welcome, again, if I didn't say that, you know, through everything, how, what is the functionality of each department? What are the names of each department? How many do we have? Do they ingest, ingest money? If so, how? What are the checks and balances we have in place? Does invoicing get involved? If so, where does, how does invoicing work? Where's the checks and balances for that? How does that work? 
simply because I want to know. And I, I want to actually not be asking this because I want to know that you want to know too. So for me, when I elected you, it's because good, you're doing it. I'm thrilled you're there. Can you do, you know, can you? So I just want to know that you're having the same ruminations and that you want to know the same answers and that we come together to have those answers and that it's really transparent. I'm not saying you're not transparent now. I'm just saying that all, all the details, um, names of each department, roles within which departments and just money, how it occurs, who determines what amounts are, like for example, fees for businesses. Let's say village, let's say previous to Regina, who's very kindly writing this all. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, if a business comes and there's a fee for them to be here, whatever that is, who decides that? Is it decided by the head of the department? Like which role decides that? So and, I don't want to be rude, Annie, but yeah, mind, can you, can we great. I'm almost finished. Great. Thank you. And then um, how can we learn more about those things as they occur? Um, and then how does the city budget work in regards to those departments? Which, which piece of our budget go there and how much of ingested money covers costs versus what the budgetary money covers and who decides that? And then here's my, here's my big other question. Once funds, let's take our village of voices, for example, was it 10? I think it was 10,000 that went to our village of voices. Am I right? 8,000, 10,000. How much money went to our village of voices? It was decided at a meeting. I think it was 10. There about. Okay. Who accounts for that? How much got spent? Is it a line item thing that we could, does it? And who I know is maybe it's true. Does it come in the book that I get every year? Is that accounted for literally before my eyes? And then if I understand correctly, at the end of each fiscal year, unspent, unspent money goes back into a general fund, right? Is it, a, is it literally accounted for as it goes back into the general fund? And how do we as residents learn what those numbers are and how that got accounted for? And I would have that question for all of the budget and how and what happens at year's end, fiscal year's end and year's end. All right, thank you very much for letting me talk so much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. And just real quick, a lot of what you're talking about is great uh, feedback of ways that we can help to broader educate our community as to what the role is of the board, of staff, um, how we, are, we as a policy board help to oversee <laughs> the policies that our staff then carry out, the discretion then that staff have, the role of the annual external audit that we have every year in terms of checks and balance, uh, the only other portion is really quickly talk about uh, with equity. We have not, as a board, had a conversation, I believe, since we've separated, truly focused on equity. So we certainly have a lot of room to go in that. Um, but many of the things that you've, you've asked about are things that we do talk about on a regular basis, also during the budget meeting that we have, the day-long budget meeting, uh, presentations from our, our staff when they come to us, the annual audit when that comes. So we certainly have these conversations. But Great. definitely a lot of good feedback of ways that we can better educate the community. Great. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thanks, Amber, too. Oh, I can't see. <clears throat> all right. So there was nobody else in the room. Uh, on Zoom, I see that Jess Wazowski has a question. Go ahead. If you can unmute yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, I don't have a question. I wanted to comment myself on my very own time. Is this supposed to be for follow-ups to any? Uh, if you want to address any questions or comments to me, that's greatly appreciated. Okay, so this is just the public comment, and now I get my chance to do public comment, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm the person. I'm the person who started the whole Scrum on Facebook, and I am also a single parent, solo income teacher in the public school system in Burlington, and I'm also super entitled because I grew up in Essex Junction. I spent 13 years of my childhood here. I helped fight for and then establish the teen center, hauled couches in my mom's van to get them in there. I'm overjoyed that it still exists. I've been a taxpayer and homeowner here for nine years. And I'm feel, I feel like super entitled to be able to speak out in spaces like Facebook in ways that other people aren't. And I very much feel like it's important to be a person that speaks out. Oh, also is involved in the Essex governance group. When this child was one year old, she would sit on the floor at Essex High School doodling as I met with people from the town and the junction 
And it was in response to like multiple front porch forum posts of people saying how crazy the voting was in Essex and why can't we just sort things out for good? And I would establish those meetings. And then finally, first we all got together and there were like 10 people in the room and it was amazing because that many people cared to get together and sure it ended up in a divorce, but this is sometimes when things get better, right? So <laughs> I feel very also invested in like helping this place that we are like figure out what we what we want to be and I, I I was frustrated because when I showed up that evening I thought it was the big pumpkin lighting because I remember a fond memory pre-COVID of the big pumpkin lighting being a thing that you could go down to and it was filled with people milling around and just some fire pits and I think there was a storyteller somebody had hired and there might have been free cider or something but uh, when we went down, it was just a giant line, two lines, because you had the line of people going one direction and the other line looping around to get into the park. And it was a paid event. And I was meeting my mom and my daughter there. And um, we didn't have enough cash on us between us to go in. And it's a, it's a candy trail, which she went to the candy trail when it was held also for free at the Champlain Valley Fairgrounds, which she was a wee one and too young to do trick or treating, but it was so lovely and so fun. And we got to see high school kids and fire people who work in the fire department and stuff. So it was like really wonderful and really fun. And uh, we've always been involved in Parks and Rec. Like she went there for daycare from ages three to five and does after school care there. So like we are huge supporters of Parks and Recreation. And you would think we'd be on an email list, but there is not, I guess, an email list. Everything's opposed on Facebook. And I'm a working parent, a solo parent, a uh, full-time parent all the time for this child. And I don't see everything on Facebook because it's be held into algorithms. So if the post that they made about the fact that it was going to be $10 came at 2 p.m. when it spiked in my feed and I wasn't looking online, I wouldn't have had a way of knowing it. I even dug back on their Facebook posts. And the tile that they were sharing didn't say the amount at the door. It was the comments that they wrote that said the amount at the door. Or like one of the tiles, they might have made five different tiles. But I've worked in social media and I've worked online. I feel like both in the outreach that they did to alert people that you could pre-register and that it was going to be a paid event. And also the fact that the pumpkin lighting went from being a free, fun, easy event to something that I had to plan for, round up some other people for, because it's just two of us and it's a $10 entry fee. Like it it wouldn't have been a thing probably would have gone to anyway. So that was my big complaint. But I think that, I don't know. I think it's a straw man argument for people's feelings to be all hurt over this because I'm not insulting anybody who put it on or saying it wasn't a wonderful event. I'm saying, do we want to be a community that charges $10 for residents for a community event? <laughs> That's it. That's the end of the story. Um, I would like to think we can find a way to maybe make it super clear when events are charge only or look at ways of making intergenerational all community events and then maybe family events or events to cash in on outsiders because it sounds like from what people shared privately with me the reason they charged is because so many outsiders came so if we're trying to cash in on outsiders coming to Essex Yahtzee that's great like how about make it be one of those kid events that people are scrambling for that's for little kids just like the halloween trail but maybe don't do it on public <sighs> property that people normally would have access to and like sort of ruin the other event that was held for free for years which is going to see the pumpkin lighting um that's it i also think that we should have kayaking access to the winooski river somewhere in essex because of all the towns south of jonesville we don't have any we're like the only one that doesn't have any so that was a secondary point but I would happily do a presentation on that in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jess. All right, I see no other hands up. So that will end public to be heard and we'll jump into business item 5A, which is a presentation from GBIC. And I see that we have Sam Anderson here from GBIC. Hello, Sam. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak to you this evening. Um, I truly appreciate it. GBIC has always uh, appreciated the support of the now city of Essex Junction and the town of Essex. Um, in my letter uh, requesting 
that you consider a contribution for FY24. Um, I put in the amount that both entities have generously given us in the recent past. To be candid, we never dove into who gave what as far as amounts. Our support for Essex Junction and the town does not waver. Um, we still put in consistent work um, with the businesses and the community. And since March of 2020, the state asked us to also step up working with businesses that have not traditionally been in our wheelhouse, such as commercial, retail, food and beverage, in helping get them the information about the various grants and forgivable loan programs that ARPA and the state have put out. Um, it's um, been a, a bucket of work. However, it's been joyous in uh, getting to know all sorts of businesses um, because we usually deal with dollar importing and value added businesses such as your large employer global foundries. And we're there working with them on a variety of issues monthly. Um, and uh, we're thrilled to do so. I am not gonna presume to give you a specific request. You know, traditionally, um, the two municipalities graciously contributed $7,500. Um, this will be your first year separated in a long time. I hope you still feel strongly about supporting the work that we do. Um, and I leave it to your good judgment. Best case scenario, I would hope each municipality would divide that amount and continue to support us. But it's up to you. And I don't want to be presumptuous. The most important thing to GBIC is your contribution demonstrates support to the work and activity that we conduct every year. And that's the most important part of your contribution. But we're well aware of everything that um, all the pressures that every municipal budget is facing. I do enjoy attending the municipal managers meetings, which are hosted by the Regional Planning Commission, our partner. And I always work to bring valuable information to that monthly meeting um, to our municipal partners. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, in the request letter, we also included our performance dashboard um, that I hope you've had an opportunity to look at, which tells you throughout Chittenden County, how many businesses we've worked with, how we've assisted them, because not everyone who lives in the village, in the, sorry, city of Essex Junction works within Essex Junction. Um, I'm confident you have residents that work in other businesses throughout the county. Oh, yeah. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. 
Thank you, Sam. I think what, um, unless I'm mistaken, uh, to be quite direct, I don't think GBIC has come to our one of our board's meetings in the past, given that our contribution has always been through the town of Essex. So from my perspective, this is a first time conversation uh, and really appreciate having this, this again, unless I'm mistaken and have missed something, which is always possible. Yeah. Uh, um, we, gee, I'm horrified, but to my knowledge, you received a letter via your, at the time, unified manager. It was right. addressed to both of, both municipalities. Right. Uh, and okay. my recollection of this is the first time, though, to have a conversation with GBIC besides receiving okay. a letter. Uh, All right. So something that just might be helpful is what does the GBIC do and how would this, this contribution help GBIC and thus then be able to help our community? Uh, oh. It was great to hear how uh, GBIC was, is recently being asked to go beyond industrial, which is fantastic, given that while we have global foundries, we have many other types of commercial businesses here in our community that we care very deeply about and want to right. see be just as successful, if not more so, than, than global foundries. Right. And um, I'd be happy to. GBIC, which stands for the Greater Burlington Industrial Corporation, is one of the 12 nonprofit regional development corps called RDCs that exist throughout Vermont. And we each have a region. In our case, it is Chittenden County. We were formed by a volunteer board in 1954. And one thing we did shortly after formation, which GBIC is very proud of, we built the first building that IBM came and leased from us when they came to Essex Junction. GBIC built that and leased to IBM. And we've been a partner with them and now Global ever since. Um, we also develop, at the request of the state, um, different projects. For example, we have something called the Regional Priority List. And your new town city manager is very familiar with this, Regina, um, who sat on the committee when she was with the RPC. We identify the top 10 regional priority projects, which is requested by the Northern Orders <clears throat> NBRC Regional Commission. By being on that list, you can qualify for extra points when you apply for an NBRC grant. We review that list twice a year. And I'm very pleased to say, we currently have two projects for as the city of Essex Junction on that regional priority list. And I'm in touch with your staff for updates twice annually on those projects. They're then ranked by a committee which has formed a staff from GBIC and the Regional Planning Commission. And then we just completed that review uh, about 10 days ago. And then we submit this document to the state and it can help the projects in the top 10. Needless to say, because we're, we work with Chittenden County, um, our list is longer than that. We have up to 16 projects, but it's the first 10 that can qualify for an MBRC grant. However, if you're on the list, no matter where you rank, the legislature is now saying it's important to be on the list to qualify for other grant and then forgivable loan programs. Um, so we work on that document. 
We're also in the middle of working on a set comprehensive economic development strategy. You may remember about 18 years ago, we did one. And now we're doing a new SEDS with three other counties. We are the West Central region and it's Chittenden County, Addison County, Washington County, Rutland County, and two towns in Orange County. Um, and our second draft has just been released on that document. It does planning. And this is taken, we've been working on this for what, Regina, a year and a half. I believe it was early 2021, March, that we started on this. We work on this document for the purpose of presenting it to the federal EDA, Economic Development Authority. And by doing so, it will permit us to qualify as an Economic Development District, EDD. Can you tell the world of Economic Development loves acronyms? By doing so, it will make us, put us in a position to qualify for more federal funds for infrastructure projects and designated high priority economic development projects. And I hope I haven't lost you on this. It's a world, no, I, it's a world I adore, but it can be a little dry when I explain it. But well, it's, been, um, it's been very helpful. Thank you, Sam. Uh, okay. Counselors have other questions? I do not. <clears throat> Great. Do not. Do not. Do not right now. All right. I appreciate um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dashboard of uh, projects that you had. Okay. I appreciate the and I would always love to come back now, make this a yearly moment in time. Great. We appreciate that, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your consideration. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next on our agenda, we have a conversation with our fire chief, Chris Caborio. Hello, Chief Caborio. Nice to see you. Good evening. Good to see you. So, here. Just going to bring up my presentation. Yeah, so I'm good. You're good. Okay. So, put together a few slides just to uh, recap kind of where we are here in the department, where we are going this year. Um, I know a topic that's always on everybody's mind is staffing. So, um, we continue to have some some very good success next door. Um, we, we've uh, finally come to realize that, uh, you know, in years past, you were always looking for those members that would that would, you know, reside in Essex Junction owned owned property and would be here for, you know, 10 years and we'd have them on the department for a long time and that's just not the case anymore. So, uh, you know, we realize that that most of the the volunteers that come through the door to uh, join our organization, a lot of them do not own property and, and tend to be uh, apartment dwellers and um, that's all good. So. Um, needless to say, we've, um, we're, we're seeing more of a turnover, um, you know, seeing that three or four people every year that, that move on in life, move out. Um, but lucky for us, we've got those three or four others coming in the door. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, we're working to, uh, maintain staffing. Our target, if you would, is, is right around that 25 to 35 individuals to support the operation. And uh, right now we're approaching 35, so we're uh, we're we're maintaining. So that's all good. Um, moving along, call volume again. Um, it's amazing year over year. It just never seems to change. We fall right within that 500 550 call volume. That's we're on track to do that uh, this year as well. 
it's uh, pretty much a 30, 35, 60, 65% split. So we're doing that EMS, that first response in, in assisting with Essex Rescue. So for what happens is, is if Essex Rescue is committed to another call uh, and, an, and another call for, for EMS comes in for the village, for the city of Essex Junction, um, we get our first response gets dispatched. So we have about uh, eight EMTs that, um, that are on the department and they will respond directly to that location and provide aid until that next responding ambulance arrives. So uh, that's, that's the split, uh, pretty much a, like I said, a 70, 30% split for fire to EMS. Um, one big um, project we've been working on this year and we were successful with obtaining an AEMT license. So that just, that allows our EMTs to operate for those that are trained at, at a higher level of, or to provide a higher level of care for individuals. Mm -hmm. um, most of your ambulances in the area respond, uh, you know, operate at that level. We now as a first response service will operate at that same level. So, you know, we can, we can provide that same amount of care for that individual and basically expedites that transfer from what we've done to um, what that ambulance crew is, is, is going to take over and do as well. Can I ask a quick question just on the, sure. the, AM, the AEMT thing yep. in general? What we heard not that long ago from Essex Rescue about just some of their struggles, both in terms of their ability to have staffing, um, their, their model and having the, the, uh, the personnel to help respond to calls is this something where is is this complementary to Essex Rescue? Is it something where are there calls that uh, the Essex Junction Fire Department could then respond to that Essex Rescue may not then need to, to maybe divert the need for them going to calls? Or is this no? We would so we would never take a call. I mean, we our service basically supports that ambulance. Um, and again, if we're dispatched it's only because Essex Rescue is on another call. Mm. So we're going to provide that assistance until the next responding ambulance comes in. So um, again, Essex Dispatch would take the call. If Essex Rescue is on a call, they have a whole matrix. We'll go, okay, next responding ambulance is St. Mike's. St. Mike's is busy. We go to Colchester. Colchester is busy. We go to Williston. It's all, District 3 board has that all laid out. So we would, yeah, we, we don't have the ability to transport. Um, we don't have any of that. So again, we're just there to provide that service. Okay. An AEMT license just allows us to, to do more things. We will be able to, uh, you'll have individuals that will be able to start an IV. We'll be able to, if, a, if an individual needs uh, fluids, they'll be able to administer that. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an unresponsive patient, we need to establish an airway, they'll be able to do that. So, so at this point in time, there's no goal to replace what Essex Rescue is doing or to take the calls over that Essex Rescue has been doing, but rather if they can't to help ensure that there's something that at least can happen until Essex Rescue or another entity could arrive. Correct. Okay. We, we have, we do not have the resources to staff an ambulance. We don't have the, re we don't have the room to park an ambulance. <laughs> We don't have a facility to right. to have people on call. Mm -hmm. So again, we're just there to assist um, and provide care until that that next ambulance arrives. So if I hear questions from the community about, so does this mean Essex Junction Fire Department is going to become a rescue organization? The quick answer is no. Not even Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Not a problem at all. Um, but again, the nice thing is is you've got people you've got people that are trained to that, um, you know, they do have some paramedics on board, but to have an AMT of AEMT available, um, it, it's not uncommon to have them say, hey, well, can we take that resource with us to the hospital? Okay, so if, if they're, you know, they have a two person staff, uh, you know, based on the care that's needed, they need a third person, um, not uncommon to see one of our EMTs go with them. So. Um, that's just a, a good thing for us. I guess actually one other related question, if we're providing some type of a, uh, emergency medical service, is that then something that we would then bill for? Bill an insurance no. company for? 
No, that's uh, again, that would all be Essex Rescue. Oh, okay. Essex Rescue or the responding ambulance would bill for that service. But okay. um, again, we provide that as a service. We don't, we don't, there's no income and, and we don't get compensated for anything that, that we provide. Cool. Thank you. And um, yeah, last but not least, uh, just talking about some equipment upgrades. Um, I know we had some funding in the budget for um, thermal imaging cameras. We do have those on order. Unfortunately, uh, we still have not received them to date, um, but they're supposed to be here before the end of the year. So they did have some manufacturing issues that they had to overcome. Um, in the meantime, so we have a large thermal imaging camera, if you would, on each one of the apparatus. We have lost two this past year. So we've only got one large one, um, but we did purchase some smaller ones we have those available in, in, in the apparatus as well. So we are certainly our timing. We are in need of thermal imaging cameras, but uh, again, they've committed to having them to us before year end. And then the other, the other thing that we've been working on is uh, converting a lot of our small equipment uh, from gas powered to battery powered. So um, just easier to operate, easier to use, faster, quicker. Um, so the association that raises money on the side, um, we actually went to them and they purchased um, some new positive pressure fans for us. So with that, we're, we're eliminating and getting rid of our gas powered fans, um, which are just cumbersome to use. They're heavy, they're larger. Um, you've got a gas engine. Now we have to have a metal exhaust pipe that we have to run to exhaust away from the opening that we're, you know, trying to pump clean air into. Um, so now it's uh, literally just a matter of bringing a fan to a door and pressing a button and uh, it operates. So no cords, no power, no gasoline, no choke, no pull. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it just makes, it just makes our job easier. And that's, that's one of the focuses to, to again, get in, do our job and get people back to the station so we can get home. Right. So, um, yeah. I asked my questions. I don't have any, I, I, I think I'm looking forward to getting more into your budget and your operations uh, in about, about three weeks from now. Um, but I, I appreciate the update very much. Well, no problem, thank you. I think you'll like the numbers that we present. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly do appreciate what we, what we get for that, that value, if you will. It's, <clears throat> appreciate the time of, of you, of your, your members in general, and the, uh, your, your, your membership broadly. So really do appreciate that. And please do, as always, pass the appreciation on to the, the full membership of EJFD. Absolutely, will do. Great. This All right. trivial, but everybody loves seeing them on Halloween. Yes. Uh, yeah. I know it sounds silly, but, you know, everybody's like, oh, they're finally here. So, yeah. yeah. I know it's, uh, they were they were upset that they, we you know, we weren't be able to get out the last couple of years with COVID. Um, so again, this year was uh, was a good year. Mm -hmm. So I know we supported uh, we supported the operation over here at the uh, Maple Street Park yep. and they were able to get out on Halloween night. So everybody was happy about that. Yeah. yeah. I think the police were playing uh, Ghostbusters yep. um, songs as well. It was pretty funny. Anyway, it's a good time. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Cabore. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> All right. Next, we have a uh, discussion and consideration of miscellaneous municipal ordinance issues. Yeah, so um, let me find my memo here. All right, so the trustees back in September uh, 2021 adopted um, a new public nuisance ordinance. And uh, as we were trying to get that up online, we realized there's a number of sections of your um, existing municipal ordinance, ordinance that now is redundant. Um, so really the intention here of this effort isn't necessarily to do anything different than what was adopted in September, 2021, but we just have to rescind essentially a bunch of other pieces that are now no longer needed. Um, <clears throat> I did hear from uh, Lieutenant Kissinger today, though, that they've, so 
I'm not sure if you folks are aware of this, but they're trying to get the same set of ordinances adopted over at the town and the city so the police can follow one guy. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so in those discussions, um, they've heard from the town attorney that it might be pretty difficult to enforce the aggressive panhandling mm -hmm. component of that. So as we look at this, we may just want to look at that one section um, and we can have uh, Claudia and take a look at that for you guys. Um, so um, we have to do this through a public hearing process. Mm -hmm. So the, the recommendation in front of you right now is to warn a public hearing for your December 14th meeting um, so we can get that in there correctly. Um, we do also have to incorporate in your minutes the complete strike through change that's being proposed. Um, I think at the moment that can be done on the night of the minutes from the 14th. Um, if that can't happen, we might need to extend this process, <laughs> but that's the hope. Um, and then, yeah, mm -hmm. go from there. Um, there are some other ordinance topics that have come up as of late. Um, smell from cannabis operations, ducks, um, unregistered vehicles on roads, and a number of other things that definitely will take more time to research and figure out. Mm -hmm. um, my recommendation to you tonight is that we don't have the capacity to get into those issues right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my suggestion is that we kind of move forward, get this ordinance cleaned up so the police and the public are clear what the public nuisance ordinance is, um, and then uh, focus on these other issues when we, we can get some time to do that. And so just to compartmentalize sort of our conversation, um, Regina, would you say it's appropriate where if we first just focus on the, uh, the rescissions um, and amendments uh, to get that process laid out. And then after that, after that motion, we can then have the separate conversation around the other, the other topics. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. And where does the, and, and while that's happening, we'll deal with the aligning the city and town on what we have adopted and they're still working on the topic for, yes. the, for the new, and that's going to happen parallel or when yeah, it'll happen when it happens. That's a good question. I'm not sure exactly where the town is in their process and getting the document that you folks adopted in 2021, where they are and getting that across the, the finish line. Um, so I can look into that too, because I it's a good question about whether there's going to be anything else that ends up being different between the town version and the city. I think there were a few things just version. from, you know, spending great time watching their meetings. Yep. Yeah. Um, there were a few things like the, um, I'm remembering the public nudity. Mm -hmm. Right. Public urination and such. Um, I think they struck, but you know, it's, I guess it's a matter of how much the PD really wants to align. And, you know, with, uh, also a great conversation <laughs> as to whether some of that's always going to be possible. Yeah. Right. Considering the differences, um, which, I don't know. Yeah, well, I can certainly figure out where they are in their process and, and make sure that you've got the information for December 14th and you can um, Yeah, I don't know how many changes I can bring you on the night of the 14th if we warn the public right. hearing tonight. So um, well, as long as we can get this part done, right? right. Yeah, you know, we don't really need to. We've already done the other. Yeah. The new one. Yes, yes, so yes. We're good, right? So and we can have the, the police department when the town figures out mm -hmm. their portion, they can always come back to us with what those changes were. We can then reopen that and have those conversations for a period of time. Yep. We'll get there. Yep. So yeah, I'm I'm perfectly fine personally just moving forward with uh I guess cleaning up our <laughs> our ordinances um, and cleaning that up so that, that way uh, we can then have a, a better organized, less duplicative document. So with just that first portion, I would entertain 
the motion. Sure. Somebody I, will still want to I read. will move that the city council warn a public hearing on December 14th at 6 30 p.m. for the following changes to the Essex Junction municipal ordinances. I will read them now. <laughs> <laughs> Rescind Chapter 6, Regulation of Soliciting, Chapter 7, Noise Ordinance, Chapter 10, Regulations of Public Indecency, and Chapter 13, Regulations of Public Nuisance in their entirety. Amend Chapter 9, Enforcement by Deleting Reference to 6, 10, and 13, and Amend Chapter 16, Ordinance Prohibiting Graffiti, Defacement of property and placing substances in public fountains by rescinding sections 1601 and 1602. Thank you, George. Can we get a second? Second. Thank you, Raj. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great, so that passed unanimously. And then I will move that staff prioritize the research for other ordinance issues, including smell, ducks, and unregistered vehicles in Hang roads. on, oh, hang on a quick second. there? Nope, nope. Oh, yet. okay. Um, so, this, so now we're into the second part of the conversation. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, uh, it's fine. So that is if we want to, um, this is now if we want to have staff prioritize doing the research for these other topics. If we do, we have Regina acting as the interim zoning administrator. We don't have a community development director. And so if we allow for this, then that means other things need to come off the table. Oh, okay. Can I back up one step? Right. Did you, which one of those did you read? I read the top one. Right. Okay. No, so I believe that was the correct one. one. All right. I'll just make it the correct one. <laughs> Uh, I, I misunderstood, Andrew. I thought, I mean, I, I gave a lot of latitude to the word prioritize. We don't really know how long that is, but I, I'm sorry. And I, I will rescind the, the part of it. I, I don't, I'm not really. Yeah, it's, it's I, a question from staff of, do we want staff to prioritize these initiatives right now over other things? Can I ask a specific question relative to this? Yeah. I know there was a gentleman in here uh, at our last meeting and he, his, what, he obviously wanted the, 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 um, the chicken ordinance amended. Is that, is that what this is about? I know that we have both uh, residents in the room as well as online who who uh, wanted to speak to the the duck portion. Okay. Well, I, I mean, yeah. Okay. I can. I, I'll 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 take back what I was reading and I'll um, sit and listen and learn. But even before we we specifically get into to ducks, just again, that is the portion of and Regina, please correct me if I'm wrong whether or not we want to have staff to take the time to research these efforts, uh, and if so then we would need to figure out what is coming off the table so that that way <clears throat> staff can do that work. Correct. Okay. Rob? I guess I'd want to have an opportunity, and I don't think it's now because we haven't had a chance to think about it, to really think about the totality of what's coming. You know, I still feel like we have, you know, with Regina arriving, we had a huge list of things to do. We, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around. And then to this week, go through. You had sent an email five or six months anyway. Yep. <laughs> I would really like to have an opportunity to get together as a board and see where we are generally mm -hmm. before we ask staff to go any further <clears throat> than we absolutely have to on things that I feel are extra right now. And by extra, I don't mean they're unimportant. I don't mean that they aren't someone's priority, but. Um, Everyone is very limited and we have things we have to get done for the city. Yeah. Um, that I still think are very open questions. Um, and as far as the ordinance specifically are concerned, I know that were we to go out and spend a few minutes, we'd probably have other people coming with other priorities. And I think we should have a bigger picture of what um, those are. Um, I know of, of a couple instances that have been back and people are being very patient as we make this transition and they've been asked to be patient for a year or two. So I think, yeah. I think having a, a, a larger conversation around um, prioritization would be helpful. And uh, along that line, I know Regina and I have talked a little bit about having just a general strategic planning opportunity for our board yeah. uh, and for staff uh, potentially have involvement from committees and beyond to really help ensure that we sort of have that North star as to what is it we're trying to do we, we're building a city that's great and wonderful, and what's next, um, and, and how are we going to get there? Aligning that with our budget process, aligning that with overall strategic goals, um, to report back onto the community of our progress so far. So we're, we're having some of those conversations, um, and certainly uh, we'll bring that back to the full board once 
we can kind of <laughs> get to a point where we can breathe again, maybe. And, and yeah. getting and getting input too. You know, right. I mean, you know, having that back and forth with the community to say this is what this still has to be done, um, and being able to ask them questions and get the feedback. Right. Yeah, and I'll just if I may, Andrew, mm -hmm. um, just to clarify that the thinking of that strategic process is definitely intended to give it some really good time. So we're thinking this would be starting in the spring, late winter, spring to help prepare us for the FY25 budget, not necessarily for the FY24 budget as that's um, upon us <laughs> right now, so. Right, three weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give or take a week or two. Uh, so in, in terms of that um, prioritization process or that uh, whether the, the council should have staff prioritize some of these issues, um, I do know that there are uh, community members who wanted to speak on these topics. Uh, I believe that there are a few here in the room, and I know that there's one online. Uh, last time we prioritized those in the room, so this time we'll prioritize those online. Uh, so if you wanted to speak to this issue as members of the public, and you are on Zoom, if you don't mind just raising your hand, just to make sure, uh, using Zoom to raise your hand or on the camera. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so that way I can uh, see how many people that we have. And then in the room, just to raise your hand as well. Okay, great, I appreciate that. So there's a couple of hands up. Uh, Jason, if you wanna go first, uh, That'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, I see Sharon with her hand as well. So Sharon, you can go after. My only ask is if we can keep each person to under five minutes, um, that would be greatly appreciated. So Jason, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Hi, um, yep, so just to clarify, um, I did not request to change the uh, chicken ordin ordinances. I didn't wanna change any ordinances at all. <clears throat> I requested a uh, an exception so that I can keep uh my ducks in accordance with the uh agricultural program but um i haven't received any complaints regarding cannabis i do have the city's only craft uh cannabis cultivation that is a commercial operation um so if there has been any complaints i would i'd be interested to hear it now um but as as of yet the only thing I've heard of uh, in terms of a complaint of smell is the ducks. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, like, as I said before, I'm asking for an exemption in this one instance, not to change the actual documentation. So uh, I understand that the, the council has a lot of priorities at this point. However, um, when I spoke with the council earlier, um, if you guys don't, make this a priority then i'm gonna to have to slaughter all my ducks and start over uh so i would prefer not to do that um the the ducks are a, a an integral part of the permaculture for the cannabis you know cultivation i have and uh, i use it to uh, create the fertilizer i need for the cultivation <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, and just for full disclosure for everybody, when Jason was referencing speaking to a counselor, he and I spoke earlier, um, uh, just as a part of ensuring that Jason knew this was coming up, uh, and then just some follow-up questions from there. So, uh, so anything I, else, Jason? Well, I think, you know, in terms of resources, in terms of getting an objective opinion, it, it, you know, if it, it would take one member or however many members of the council to go visit Sharon's property and, and see, you know, if there is an actual smell um, that you guys would deem inappropriate and we can move from there. Um, Thank you for that, Jason. Um, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? Um, no, I mean, otherwise, I mean, uh, I'm not asking to change any documentation. I was hoping to get a, a, a an exemption. So that, that's my request. Great. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, for everybody else, as it's your turn, please make sure that you address any questions or comments to me and we'll, we'll go from there. If I can't answer them, I'll try to find somebody who can in the room or else it'll just have to wait until another time to be answered. Uh, so Sharon, uh, you're next. Hi there, thanks for taking my comments. Um, so um, I have had a couple of conversations with Jason 
um, about different things that have gone on. Most recently, um, about a month ago, about the ducks as well as the cannabis smells. Um, I am not the only one who has made complaints or feels that there is an issue. Uh, we can't use our backyard, our deck, or our front patio in the summer because in the summer heat, the smells are so bad. Um, certainly from cannabis, but also there's some other stench overriding it because we've been dealing with the cannabis smell for a couple okay. of years now. So we kind of have gotten <laughs> familiar with that, unfortunately. Um, we're not the only people. Everyone on the street notices when people walk by on the street. Um, and if they've stopped and talked to you at the, um, you know, wherever you are in your driveway, doing yard work, doing gardening, people ask about the smells. People ask about the sounds, about the duck sounds. Um, there's a lot of noise from the ducks as well. There is also a clear ordinance about four chickens. It's pretty clear. So, um, you know, Jason has said he is raising them for a number of reasons, one including that they're going to be used for food. Okay, I respect that. I respect all those things, but we are in a neighborhood where it is, our lawns are next to each other and our properties run right alongside of each other. We've lived here for 20 years and it is very, very difficult for us to even have any peace of mind in the summer in Vermont when you wanna be outside. So um, yeah, we have a problem with it. And it is, so we, you know, we are hoping that the board, if you do take this up, that you actually do do some, um, you know, canvassing of other neighbors and other people in the neighborhood, because it is obvious we are some of the closest people, however, <laughs> so we are affected the most, but it's really, unpalatable to be here in the summer. It's not bad now because it's winter and it's cold. So I will stop there because I've probably gone by five minutes. Uh, not yet, but I hear you, Sharon, if that's all that you have. I can say more Great. about, you know, predators and things and vermin and mice, and I'm worried about diseases, but, you know, those are all things that come along with farms and this isn't an agricultural area. And that's not what we signed up for when we bought this property either. So, ask a follow up. Uh, sure, go ahead, Raj. Sharon, you said something about a couple of years for this activity and cannabis. Has there been cannabis growing there for a couple of years, or has it just been this past few months? Nope, it's been a couple of years. Um, as many as three for cannabis, probably two for ducks. Um, possibly more for cannabis. I know Jason has told us in the past. I think we often get told what he wants us to believe, but um, we've been told originally that it was because he has a broken back and it's for pain, that uh, it, it helps his pain and it's a medical thing, that's fine. Um, we're respectful of that. It's just that <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's, there's reciprocity in that, you know. Um, I'll, I, think, <clears throat> I think a little bit of it makes a little bit of a smell and it's rather tolerable. You know, people smoking it, it's it's happening all around town anyways, but we've dealt with huge swaths of air coming over for short periods of time in the past as well with people smoking marijuana. Okay, you shut your windows for a little bit, you shut your doors, you go back, you know, if you're out eating on your deck, you go inside. Okay, that is, it is a bummer, but now it's nonstop all summer. Mm -hmm. like literally all summer the heat of the summer so <laughs> anyhow that is really the bottom line thank you sharon uh i'm not seeing any other hands up on zoom so as we come back into the room uh, i believe the gentleman in the front here i'm sorry i didn't i don't know your name steven, steven. <laughs> thank you steven uh if you don't mind just uh come on up to the the microphone here and... thank you uh so steven really um yeah, I think Sharon hit most of the points um, that I had intended to say as well. Um, I think it's important to note that 
Uh, so to the question of you know how long the cannabis has been growing, it has been several years. I don't know exactly. And this this past season, I don't know. You know, I didn't count them, but there were twenty to thirty large plants. Jason did a fantastic job of cultivating. You know, he had gigantic plants, and we could tell um, uh, from the smell. Um, the use of, uh, I mean, whether it's the the um, duck feces or other things, there have definitely been um, not as bad as the liquid manure you get when you're near the farms, but really terrible smells around the entire house, front front yard, backyard, doesn't matter. Um, when there's runoff, uh, our, our lawns are sloped and of course there's no water block. So when there's runoff, the entire side of our house, uh, uh, the side yard um, is covered in water that has come down from both yards. So we don't know what's in it, but we still have to you know walk through it if we wanna walk around that side of the house. Um, uh, the, it, I think it's also important to note that, you know, this isn't one, two, three, or four ducks, you know, as, as the chicken rules would say, we're talking about, I think it's 14 or 15 ducks right now. And, you know, he started with seven chicks a couple of years ago, and it's pretty much gone up from there. So it's not, um, it may be reasonable to, to have some exception for, you know, following the chicken rules but with ducks, um, but probably not for three or four times the allowed quantity. Uh, regarding noise, um, I think I had sent an, an email um, about some of this, but um, you know, we we typically, so our bedroom is on the opposite side of our house from, from Jason's property. Uh, we typically run a, an air conditioner or a noise maker of some sort uh, to overcome the noises of Route 15. Uh, and we can still hear the ducks in the middle of the night. Sometimes they get riled by something and suddenly there's just loud noise. Um, you know, we don't know what it is, but it's noticeable. So I think that hit everything. Okay, great. <clears throat> Appreciate that, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks. So we had the, the question in front of us. Um, I think just from, from what I'm hearing personally, once we have a community development director hired, some of these seem like great projects as they're coming on board. Things like smell uh, would be great to to have uh, some type of resolution on. Um, but at this point in time, personally, I don't see the precedence for uh, for prioritizing all of this now, especially given <clears throat> the staffing vacancy and uh, being in the point in time of budget season as we're trying to finalize this upcoming year's budget to put out the vote. So. Personally, I'm in favor of having the ordinances that we have, and as we have uh, increased staffing capacity, picking some of this up in a, that subsequent time period. Yeah. Councilors, anybody feel differently? No, I think uh, I agree with you. The I remember when we established this ordinance relating to uh, fowl, chickens, uh, ducks, what have you, and. Uh, Many of these issues that have been presented tonight were things we discussed back then, as you yeah. recall, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, no, it's, you know, it's tough with the staffing we have right now to address these things. I understand that, but definitely something that we need to address. And uh, as uh, she said earlier, you know, coming on on winter pretty soon here and, you know, maybe some of the smells won't be so bad, but definitely something to look at. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Amber, George, anything else? No, I'm, I'm good with, with the rest of you. So with that, if we're not asking staff to do anything differently, then there's no need for a motion, uh, no need for a vote. And so with that, I guess, uh, thank you for those of you who came out and, and spoke. Um, and we'll move forward with the status quo as to what we have. Uh, as things change, I'm sure we'll reach back out to uh, start some of these conversations about how best to uh, help mitigate smell, uh, so on and so forth, and, and we'll take it from there. And I appreciate all of your patience. So thank you all. And uh, I see that we have Charlie Baker in the room. So uh, we'll rearrange the agenda a little bit to just uh, 
jump on in with Charlie and having a presentation from the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate you, you again. making the adjustment. Yeah, and uh, good to see you in person again for the first time in three years, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, Elaine Haney, I think maybe trying to dial in as well. I don't know if she's there, but uh, so um, I think you got our annual report in your packet. Um, I just wanted to kind of briefly review that. And this is, um, as you remember, kind of a customer service call. I just wanted to see how we're doing in terms of providing services to you, like, you know, giving you a new city manager, <laughs> you know, little, little things like that. Um, <laughs> No worries, no issues. You're not going to charge us extra. Fees. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's, I'm sure there's a, there's a fee. But, um, so, um, but back to the report. Uh, <laughs> the first page gives you background uh, about the RPC, um, including uh, membership on our board, a little bit about our finances and how we leverage uh, local dues to, uh, to bring in state and federal dues into the region. Uh, your representatives on our board and committees. Uh, thank you. They've been very active. Thanks to Dan, who's a very regular attendee at our board meetings and active participant. Uh, appreciate that. Um, the second page, um, and just a little bit onto the third, uh, have things that we uh, specifically did with the, the village last year, um, now city, uh, including uh, Regina working on your zoning ordinance uh, and bylaw amendments um, was probably the biggest project we had last fiscal year. Um, and apparently she worked too well on that. Um, so <laughs> that won't happen again. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but, and, I, I'd asked for feedback, but I, I can see the results. So um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's any other feedback on other projects or you know some of the data collection or other things uh, that you want to give me, but happy to take that at this point. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just really, frankly, just appreciate CCRPC as in the in general. Um, the, the things that you you all have done for Essex Junction, whether as a village or a city, it's <laughs> hands down greatly appreciated. Yes. Um, the the work that you you have done and has been going on for years. Uh, congratulations as well with Darren. Um, right. Yeah, I know. Was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was tougher last night, or yeah, the other night. Yeah, in, in Essex, agreed. Uh, so <laughs> what goes around comes around, you know. It's... It, it does. <laughs> no, we, we greatly appreciate it. The CCRPC is it, it absolutely instrumental in uh, helping us as a municipality to do the things that, that we need to do for our community. So we greatly appreciate you and your, your role within the community and some of the more uh, broad things as well, like the Building Homes Together campaign. Yeah. Sorry if you're going to jump into that. Yeah, well, I was going to move on to the third and, and subsequent pages. Uh, you have one big project in the capital program, the Crescent Connector. So glad to see that moving through the process. It's it's been a while, yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, all good things. Um, and then yeah, and then the last few pages have some regional things, like including that Building Homes Together campaign. Or um, we are going to have legislative breakfast in person December eighth. So uh, heads up, um, you be probably be getting an invite. Yeah, probably to tomorrow or Friday. Uh, for that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're working on equity issues and a lot of other issues at the end there. If there's any questions or feedback on any of that, happy to happy to take that too. I think one of the things that might be beneficial for our board is um, yeah. in terms of uh, that conversation around equity is that we have not spent any time on uh, since separation. Uh, we do have a a committee for, uh, with Essex Best who's doing some work now, um, but we as our own board have not had uh, a conversation um, as it relates to equity, how we are furthering uh, our community towards that, that goal of being a more inclusive and equitable yep. community. Um, and so I think that it might be beneficial uh, to have a conversation at some point in time about how we might be able to leverage what has already been done by the CCRPC uh, to help us um, in this, in that vantage point. Yeah, I think that's very much on our minds also as how we can uh, support those conversations across the municipalities. Um, it, may, it may be a little bit, um, at least one early concept is um, a little similar conversations as we did with the housing issue um, where somebody used to host housing convenings um, and you know have the, the different housing committees in the towns uh, just share experiences and learn from each other. So I think we may be heading that way with the equity work also. There's enough going on in different municipalities 
uh, to learn from. Um, and I think it's a good question about, you know, what, what happens at the city council level and what kind of training or anything else you might have here. Um, so we'll, we'll give that some thought too. All right. You know, on that, on that note, it would be interesting, and I don't know if this is, I guess in my head, I was thinking this might be more of the OCT thing, but I don't see why it couldn't be CCRPC or yeah, it works. Um, but, you know, we have all of these different efforts going on um, in, in very small geographic areas taking up yeah. a lot of time. And I think um, not that the time is a bad thing. It's not that it's, it's not poorly spent, but it's redundant in some ways. And, you know, I, I think our board would benefit from spending quite a bit of time regularly on this. Um, and I know other boards would too. I'm just, you know, in thinking about it, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, is it <clears throat> having breakfasts or round tables or efforts monthly or quarterly and different members go? Is it having larger retreats where two or three boards show up and do work together with some staff? You know, is that a Saturday morning spent with facilitation? Or multiple boards from multiple communities can get together. You know, I think I think those conversations need to happen because counting on every single community to yep. recreate this, often with the same consultants and the same facilitators, um, is burdensome, overly expensive, redundant, um, and time-consuming for the people. Perhaps like CCRPC has to put it on, or that that's a system yeah. putting it on. So I'd, I'd love to have that conversation about how we can bring. How we can bring that to a greater scale yep. and more efficiently, but you know, and I think frankly, it, the more of those differing boards that we're bringing together, the better the conversations are going to be, yep. and the better the learning is, and the ideas will flow better. Um, when we, it's not just the five of us that are normally together. <laughs> you know, yep. Um, By also learning from your peer group, right. the yep. Danuski is going to have a vastly different approach and thought process than this board. Yeah. So, um, yep. you know, that's kind of something that I was going to bring up at our strategy session when, you know, when it comes up, but I, I would love to, to see if CCRPC could partner with that. Um, and also because you have this, this much larger view of what's going on in the, in the county, in the state, mm -hmm. you know, um, so anyway, that's a long winded. Yeah, no, I think that's good thoughts. And, and I, you know, talk regularly to Ted Brady too. And we talk about this issue about, you know, how to, you know, partner at times or sh just share information. Of course, they've, they're probably a little bit further ahead of us. They have some, some tools that they've put out there online and they have their uh, ideal cohort. I think that's the right one. Um, there's an Epic cohort too, but um, maybe I think maybe they're doing Epic. I apologize. There's a, a couple different cohorts going on uh, in equity work um, that might be that statewide you might want to plug into. And I think we're kind of following that a little bit, but I do think there's yeah some opportunities here. And, and even for the community, I think, you know, if the same community members are getting asked the same kinds of questions from different perspectives, you know, maybe we can make it more efficient for, um, you know, those people that haven't typically been represented yeah, in our meetings. Folks to come in and talk over and over and over yeah. about their experience can actually start be, becoming a little victim, victimizing. Yeah. Yes. So, right. You know, anything we can do to, to yeah, brainstorm a better process. Um, yeah, I guess that, is. that is good. And, we, and we're very much in the early stages, you know, we're, um, been working for a number of months, but just forming an equity advisory committee now that's um, actually, I think this month we're gonna formally appoint members. Um, so we're still in the very early stages also, but um, thank you for letting me know that. And that's good thoughts. Yeah. Any other feedback or questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or Amber or? or Great. You good. All right. I think we're all right, George. I thought you were about to say something. No, 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 no. no. I was trying to think of some deep philosophical question to trip you up on. <laughs> good. It's I. Yeah, I hear my mother calling me. Sorry. <laughs> Charlie, thank you as always. No, really thank you, it. and yeah, keep up the the great work. And I know you're keeping her busy, so that's good. Yeah, after all trouble. No, good. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Charlie. You. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> All right. Uh, so our next business items, so business 5D, 5E, and 5F are all conversations that we would be having in executive session. Uh, and as such, I would request that we move past those and to go into the consent items so that then when we come back, we just have the executive session items to go through. So if we're good with that, move into the consent. 
I'll move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Great, so passed unanimously. Uh, going into the reading file and board member comments, the only thing I just wanted to mention is I greatly appreciate the work uh, of those of you who spent time at the polls yesterday, uh, whether that be volunteering for a few hours, uh, those of you who volunteered for half a day, the full day, some of our heroes uh, like Diane Clemens, uh, as well as our, our city clerk, um, Susan McNamara Hill, who spent uh, somewhere around 16 to 18 hours, I believe, uh, at the polls. And so greatly appreciate uh, them, their efforts uh, in helping to ensure that we have democracy to its finest uh, and allow us to continue in this democratic process that we cherish so deeply. So I greatly appreciate the work from, from all of you who were able to do that. So thank you all. Other comments? I, I just appreciate the, the, the mundane thing, the, the pavement analysis map. Um, I, I really do. I mean, that's my, uh, but I, it was great. I appreciate that being put in there. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to maybe, um, I'm hoping that will reappear, you know, on our budget day, just so we have mm -hmm. that to, to look at and think about. That was a very good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Ricky is very appreciative to see that percentage increase and mm -hmm. how good we are in comparison to a few, few years yeah. back. And he attributed that to <clears throat> you folks giving more um, funds towards the paving effort. Yep. So mm -hmm. much appreciated. One thing I was going to say is ask Regina how it's going. It's going pretty good. Yeah, did you freeze? Yeah, Terry's back from vacation today. Oh, so <laughs> sorry. Yes. 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 Right. yes. It's, good. it's all good. It's uh, getting learning more every day. Still feel a little unorganized. Still haven't gotten out and spent time and met as many people as I would like, staff included. Um, but getting there. Great. Good. Yeah. Appreciate it, Regina. Thank you. Uh, if we have no other board member comments, uh, these motions are going to take a little bit. Yeah. Why don't you do them? And, uh... oh, you, I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit that is one of the things about this is it is not always easy to navigate from document to document. Yeah. And that might just be me. Uh, so. I assume let's just go through all of them. Is everybody okay if we just go through all of these motions at once and just have one one long vote? Yep. Great. So now that I said that, I gotta get back to the. I got one. Do you want me to do it? Uh, I got one here too. I I think I got him right here. So. I'll move to find that premature general knowledge regarding contracts associated with the tree farm recreation facility would clearly place the city at a disadvantage because the council risks disclosing its negotiation strategy if it discusses the contract terms in public. I further move that we go into executive session to discuss contracts under the provisions of Title I, Section 313, A1 of the Vermont statutes and to negotiate or secure real estate purchase or lease under, op under options, let me try it again, or lease options under Title I, Section 313A2 of the Vermont Statutes, and include Regina Mahoney, Brad Luck, and Harlan Smith. I would further move that the City Council make the specific finding that general public knowledge of contracts would place the city at a substantial disadvantage. I yet again would move that the City Council enter into executive session to discuss contracts pursuant to 1 VSA, Section 313A1A, to include the City Council, City Manager, and Water Quality Superintendent. I would further move, it's going to be a bit, that the City Council make the specific finding that general, pre, that general public knowledge of contracts would place the city at a substantial disadvantage, and then move that the City Council enter into executive session to discuss contracts pursuant to 1 VSA, Section 313A1A, to include the City Council and City Manager. And last but not least, Now I don't have the one on personnel. Uh, all right, let me see if I can just associate that one for a moment. If you go to 5F on the bookmarks on the side, should be able to find it. Oh, okay. That one's for personnel? 
sort of contracts with I think it's for personnel. Yep. Oh, right. okay. So I did make that motion uh, that was within 5F. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. sorry, there isn't a memo for the for personnel. personnel. Right. Yeah. So, so that I, motion, you can, can you make it on the fly? I would so. move that the city council enter into <laughs> executive session to discuss personnel issues pursuant to one VSA section 313 and to include the city council and city manager. Okay. Wow. Second, all of those. Thank you, Raj. Yeah. I love that role. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion on all of that? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Great to pass unanimously. Thank you all. I uh, will give the room a, a little while. Um, when we go into executive session, that's just for the board uh, to have these conversations in private. Um, when we come out, we are expecting a couple of decisions at the end. Correct, Regina? Yeah. A couple of motions at the end. Um, there might be some. Yeah. So when that happens, we'll just open the doors back up. But at this point in time, thank you all for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. If you want to hang around for when we come back into public session, if you don't mind hanging outside of the wooden doors, so exit this door here on my left, your right, that other door to your right, um, we'll have those shut and we'll open them back up when we're ready to come back to public session. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. We are back to the city council meeting for November 9th, 2022, coming back into regular session. Uh, I would first move the silly, the silly <laughs> that the city council authorize the municipal manager to sign the agreement for the sale of wastewater treatment capacity between the city of Essex Junction and the town of Williston. And it is further recommended that the revenue generated from the sale of this capacity go to the sanitation capital fund. I'll second that. Thank you, George. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Great, so that passed unanimously. And lastly, uh, I would move that the city council approve of the tree farm recreation facility lease in spirits and management agreement between the town of Essex, city of Essex Junction and tree farm management group in spirit and authorize the city manager to execute these agreements in their final form. Second. We'll give it to Raj. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Great, so that passed unanimously again. Thank you all. And we are at the end of the agenda. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. So, oops. Second, Raj. <laughs> okay, so Raj had the motion, Dan seconded. <laughs> All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All say nay. Pass unanimously. Thank you all. Have a good night. Aye.